Good morning, beautiful people. How is everybody doing today? We have about two more minutes before we get started, uh, and then we will go ahead and uh, get started with today's subject, which is uh, explaining what balanced dog training is as a movement, as a philosophy, um, as an idea, um, and as a um, as a mastery in, in dog training, uh, as striving for mastery in dog training. Uh, we'll wait about two more minutes till everything is ready to go. And then we will go ahead and get started. Hey everybody, one more minute till we get started. Gonna get started at 10 o'clock on the dot. Mm -mm -mm. Thank you guys for tuning in. Mm -mm -mm. Just pulling up some notes that I may need. Okay, one more minute. We're almost there, guys. Thanks you so much for joining and checking in. I'm about to get started soon. Okay. Those of you guys who are tuned in, go ahead and leave a comment so I know who you are. Uh, thank you guys so much for chiming in today, this Sunday morning. Um, welcome back, everybody, uh, to our uh, Sunday live streams uh, where we're going to just talk about some, give you guys some information, give you guys some knowledge that hopefully helps you and your dogs out. Um, today's subject uh, I want to talk about is I want to talk about what balanced dog training is. Um, it's, it's so funny because for the last 20, 30 years, dog training has kind of been thrown into two camps, right? We see that, um, you know, there's a pure positive aspect here. There's this camp where, you know, uh, it, it's, a very, it's a very beautiful and idealistic camp. Um, but the idea is that animals should be protected and that you shouldn't be mean to them and shouldn't be harsh to them, um, which is completely true. But this was a huge response to a different camp in dog training, which was a little bit more militant, which was a little bit more dominant, which was a little bit more um, assertive. And what ends up happening is these two camps ended up fighting over and over and over. Um, and now what happens in public, uh, in our public, um, oh, what's up, Cynthia and Corey, the dog hustle. I love that. Uh, now what ends up happening is, um, is there has been many dog trainers who come from both camps, right? And I'll, personally, a story for me, uh, when I started off as a dog trainer, um, I was in a very different camp uh, than I am now, right? Um, the way I like to look at dog training is I like to look at dog training kind of as a spectrum, right? There's different colors, which represent different training methods and philosophies. And within those colors, there's different tones and hues and shades of those colors um, that have a lot to do with um, whether or not the dog uh, the personality of the dog, the environment of the dog, so um, the potential, the the behavioral issue, the instincts that that dog might have. And so what happens is in my mind, I've been able to do this long enough with the help of many mentors and a lot of um, you know experience to be able to see uh, a bigger picture in the dog training world. Now, um, 
I, luckily I was able to grow up with a lot of trainers who are also, um, who are also very well balanced trainers. Um, but I guess before I start talking about balance, let me explain to you what balance training is so that we don't get lost from this point on. Balance training is constantly striving to, to bring balance to the dog's characteristics, uh, to bring balance to the harmony of a family and their dog, right? And this is a very difficult process sometimes because we have dogs that come from so many different genetic lines, so many different behaviors. We have people who live so many different lifestyles. Um, so ultimately, a balanced dog trainer has to have a lot of uh, tricks under their hat, right? Um, and has to, our tricks up their sleeve, right? And what this means is we have to be very knowledgeable. We have to educate ourselves on, a, on multidisciplined approaches of dog training so that way we can help this dog who has this specific problem where this dog might have completely polar opposite problems that we need to help, right? Also, what we have to keep into account as dog trainers, it's so important for us to make sure that whatever systems of training that we design or create for dogs, that it's easily applied by the family who owns that dog, right? Because as a dog trainer, we're gifted with lots of practice. We're gifted with, um, well, actually we've earned these things. We're not gifted with it. Um, te technique, timing, um, being able to read body language, being able to uh, see a number of different um, angles uh, that, that maybe the common dog owner may not be able to see, right? Um, and it takes so much time to master those things that when we teach a dog owner how to raise their potential animal, we have to make sure that we can present it in a way that is going to be helpful for them, um, that is going to be useful for them, um, and that is going to be doable by them, right? So uh, this is why having a multidisciplined approach to dog training is really, really important. Now, a little backstory on me. When I first started dog training, we started in a foundation of dog training called Keeler Method. Now, if you guys want to research Keeler Method, uh, Keeler Method is probably one of the most influential methods in military dog training in very powerful working dog training. So, for example, if I had a German Shepherd, a Rottweiler, um, you know, if I wanted to teach that dog to a very high drive dog to teach them to be very um, controllable, this was the Keeler Method. Now, Keeler Method in perspective is a very heavy handed um, uh, style of training right? And uh, I remember when I grew up in training, when I first started out, I thought that this style of training was uh, optimum. I thought this was the best, right? But over the years, what happens is you start to see the, the failures. You start to see the limits of any technique that you, that you start with, right? And what I've noticed for a lot of balance trainers that I've worked with um, and that I've, that I've gotten the pleasure of knowing We've all started in different camps, right? We've all started, uh, we all had the same thing in common, the passion, but we all may have started in different camps. Um, and so what we start learning is that the method or the ideology that we were taught or that we started off with didn't necessarily complete the whole picture of training, right? Um, and it forces the learner, or the trainer, to want to continue to grow, want to continue to get better at dog training um, and seek out other methods, other mentors, things like that, right? Um, and so this is kind of my story, right? When I was, uh, you know, a dog trainer for the first couple years, uh, we started to see some of the limits of Keeler Method. And uh, over the years, Keeler Method has been modified many, many a times. Um, I'm very happy to say that the foundation that I was given uh, from some of the mentors that I had when I was younger, the version of Keeler Method that we were doing was definitely not the orthodox version from the books. If you guys ever read Keeler Method, um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty heavy handed. But I also want to give in context that that style of training was actually designed for very powerful dogs, right? Dogs who come out of the womb who are ready to protect your house at eight weeks old, right? Also, it was designed for dogs who the other training methods did not work anymore, All right? So if you guys ever get a chance to read Keeler, he had designed a training method and a training system to be able to control the uncontrollable animals, the ones that were about to get euthanized, the ones that were biting the family, the ones that were hard to manage and control and attacking guests. So... The Keeler method came out of a good place, was effective because at the time the training methods were not working. But what you start seeing in dog training as a culture, you start seeing there's this huge swing, this pendulum swing. 
things will get pretty pushy and pretty assertive or on the dominant side, then things will swing and correct the other direction. Right. And then we'll start dealing with, you know, very emotional, very idealistic ideas, which do have value and they do work. But then you start seeing it swing the other way. And what happens is the hope for any time this pendulum swings is that the pendulum at some point lands somewhere in the middle. Right. So there's always a training method or a philosophy that ends up becoming a response to a previous um, to a previous uh, method or philosophy. Right. So a lot of the questions that I get asked a lot um, in dog training. Uh, well, I guess let me finish my story a little bit. So over the years, I've sought out information. I've taken workshops. I've gone to seminars. Um, I've researched a lot. And thank God I've been a dog trainer for 12 years because any bit of information that I knew or that I learned, I would actually bring back to the facility that I worked at. And I had the, the luxury of being able to practice with dog after dog after dog after dog. Now, after learning some of the Keeler method stuff, um, I was introduced to food work, the, the, the power of food work, exactly how amazing you, one can use food. And this was my huge eye-opening experience to positive reinforcement, the power of food, how we can motivate and shape behaviors without being, uh, you know, without using uh, compulsion training um, or aversives, right? And what we started, what I started to see is just this amazing side of, you know, two separate colors, but I started to see that this color had value, the, con the controlling, the Keeler method. And I started to see that this color had value, the positive training food work. Now from food work, I was introduced to marker training and marker training, uh, be it clickers, verbal markers, we started to see how now we can dissect behavior using precise markers, being able to notice the exact moment a dog does something and capturing that moment and giving the dog reward. And we start seeing, it's really amazing because you start to see how intelligent animals are when they have the proper motivation, right? So we have marker training. Um, on this side of the spectrum, we start seeing that uh, there's a there was a better way to use some of the techniques of Keeler method. So better timing, less correction. What I realized is working with this stuff, the positive stuff, made it easier for us to not have to give so many corrections uh, with different methods, right? But then again, we would come across situations like, okay, how do I train my dog off of a leash? Um, how do we make it so that my dog comes 100% of the time? These would be problems that would come up um, in my mind as a, as, a, as a young dog trainer. And what we start realizing is we start realizing that advanced levels of food work and motivation work at a really young age are super important. So um, I've had the luxury of teaching many advanced food work classes, but the key to food conditioning uh, for me was practice, 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 practice. I remember learning food work. I learned so much how much repetition and conditioning is the most important thing, right? Um, then I had the luxury of, of taking an agility class and getting to learn from some agility trainers, certain handling techniques, certain motivational techniques, how to teach send aways, how to teach, um, you know, how to, how, to, how to get something on cue using clickers and things like that. So it was also very important to see how to take marker training from a trick standpoint and how to see it work in action from a working dog standpoint, right? Um, then later we were introduced to different types of tools. Right. I remember for many, many years, um, I frowned upon the use of remote collars and e-collars. But nowadays, what we start seeing over the last 10 years, remote collars and e-collars have found a very sophisticated place in dog training, whereas before they were used as really lazy uh, dog training tools, right? Really heavy handed, really painful dog training tools. And I think the technology and the philosophy had to develop at the same time. Um, in order for it to be as mainstream as it is now. Okay, so e-collar work opened up a lot of doors for certain rehabilitation and certain control of uh, very reactive drives. Um, you know, for example, your dog wants to kill the dog across the street because he's leash aggressive. Well, guess what? It's sometimes the leash being on is what makes your dog aggressive. So when we're able to use remote collars in the therapy of fixing that, um, or we're able to use remote collar in unison with food work and focus work, um, then we start seeing a huge, um, a huge change in the dog's behavior and a huge, a better success rate across the board. Um, also, when we're dealing with off-leash dogs, when we're dealing with dogs who are working dogs, let's say a vishla, a cattle dog, 
Um, you know, uh, luckily here in Los Angeles, we have clients as far as Malibu, Santa Barbara, and then we have clients who live in Venice Beach in a little tiny apartment, right? So this brings us to a bunch of different environments that we have to learn. And one of my goals as a young dog trainer was how do I make sure that these owners can go hiking with their horses and their dogs? How can I make sure that if they go camping or go to a lake, if their dog sees a coyote or a bear, that their dog will not run away and go after something, right? Um, or that if he does, they can get him back immediately, right? So we started, my, my brain started branching off a little bit to try and figure out, okay, what are the right methods? What's the right application? And it's what I, what I realized, it's the passion of really trying to solve problems, the passion of really trying to, to help as many clients and as many dogs as it possibly could that created this, um, that created this, uh, this, this motivation to become what is now called a balanced dog trainer, right? Um, and I think this is ultimately a very common origin story for a lot of people. That some people, they started at one discipline, like I have two trainers right now that started um, as a pure positive method. Um, and, and I've seen this many, many times before. Um, I've trained probably over 16 people how to be dog trainers over the last year, couple years. Um, and we all started from different philosophies and backgrounds. But what happens is when you start getting introduced to how this tool can help this situation and this, this type of person needs this type of format of work, um, you start seeing how you start developing this matrix of knowledge in your head, right? Um, and I think uh, balanced dog training is ultimately the direction that dog training is going to have to go, right? It's the correction of the two of the pendulum swing, right? Now, here's the thing is balanced dog training is not a set in stone philosophy as let's say a pure positive or dominance based stuff because we have to, as dog trainers, stay dynamic and we have to stay open-minded uh, be because every dog that we train is a potential new circumstance, right? Might have similar problems as a dif dif different circumstance. So a couple things that, that really play into balanced dog training um, is we have to really make sure that we are uh, constantly seeking optimal balance for the dog right? Um, that we learn to read dogs better. We learn to read situations better. Um, and most importantly, whatever methods it is that you started it, make sure that we learn to master, uh, at least be proficient in methods before stealing techniques from it, right? Uh, which I know sometimes is hard to do. Um, I, again, I grew up in a, in a place where I had the luxury of practicing on dogs, teaching them new skills with different methods, ideas, and, 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 and I had an environment where I was allowed to do that. Um, the biggest thing with, with balanced dog trainers, we don't belong to any one particular camp, right? Um, we belong to, we pretty much have a responsibility to our dogs and making sure that we can solve problems as much as we can. Um, so that's, that's pretty much my philosophy on balanced dog training. Uh, when we are looking into, uh, let's say, how how um, uh, another way of looking at balanced dog training, um, if you guys are familiar with different forms of conditioning, let's say uh, our operant conditioning scale, our positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, positive punishment, negative punishment, a balanced dog trainer strives to utilize all four of these things in the learning process and the behavior modification of a dog. One thing also every balanced dog trainer should strive to have is a strong understanding of classical conditioning, right? Uh, classical conditioning, in essence, is uh, the emotional assignment to something that at some point was neutral, right? So an example of classical conditioning for humans, I remember I dated this girl who used to drive a white Mazda 3, right? Before dating her, white Mazda 3s had no value to me, right? Um, over time... Anytime while I was dating her, every time I would drive and see a white Mazda 3, I'd get happy, right? I assigned an emotion to white Mazda 3s. Uh, after we broke up, my emotion changed, <laughs> right? So as, as we are, um, you know, uh, as we, we as humans, we assign emotional values to things that don't originally have emotional value, like a letter or a music or a song, right? Um, dogs do the exact same thing. So this is why dogs can be scared of a certain type of person or they can be scared of a skateboard or they can be scared 
of something you know that's unknown to them um, and this is classical conditioning so part of what we also have to learn as as dog trainers is not just the four quadrants of operant conditioning but we need to know the processes of classical conditioning as well um, and this is where we live we live in the middle we live here uh, in a place where we are constantly navigating different methods, ideas, techniques uh, to try and find the right best solution. Now, I am fortunate enough that I can say that I've been doing this for 12 years. Uh, grateful enough to say that I have a lot of mentors um, and a lot of people that I've learned techniques from, whether they know it or not. I've watched, I've seen, um, I've adopted. Um, and um, this is ultimately the, the drive of a balanced dog trainer, right? Um, so that's what that is. That's what that is. Balanced dog training is all of those things. Now, those of you guys who are working with me uh, or have, have worked with me in the past, um, please be, uh, you know, uh, be aware that this exists, right? Um, because so many times I get those phone calls of what type of dog trainer are you? Can you describe to me your methods, they say. And it's very complicated to do, right? So one thing I want to show you guys, I want to kind of show you a general tool list of what a balanced dog trainer has. Uh, now, this is only some that I could gather up before our, our lesson, but come on over this way and I'll go ahead and show you a couple things. Okay. So let's see what we got here. All right, we got so many tools on the table. All right, I'm gonna. Okay, so pretty simple. We have, let's start on this side, gentle leaders. We've all heard of these. These are like little halties that go around the dog's neck. These are walking devices and tools. This is an easy walk harness or a shoulder harness. Right? These are regular back harnesses where the clip goes onto the back. There's purpose and places for this in balanced dog training as well. These are what we call training collars. So in anything that is uh, that constricts around the dog's neck, if you pull on it or gets tighter, is considered to be a training collar. So we have a bunch of different ones here. Uh, we have a, this is called a star mark. Notice the points. A lot of these tools get a lot of uh, judgment. Um, and we'll explain these a little bit later. We have a prong collar, which is the big brother to this collar here. Um, this is called a slip lead, right? We've all seen these, whether you've been at a kennel, a veterinarian, uh, this slip lead is just a loop that goes around the dog's neck. And based on that, it tightens and loosens up when the dog pulls or releases. That also makes it a training collar as well. Okay. Another very controversial uh, type of tool that some balanced dog trainers use is a remote collar, right? So this is um, a little micro or a mini or micro. Uh, educator Micro, des designed by Educator e Collars. These are more sophisticated. These are like, you remember how phones used to be pretty shitty back in the day? Well, this particular e collar is like the modern iPhone for today, right? In e, in, in e collar terms. Uh, then we have, obviously, we always have to use our food. We have to use our treat pouches. We have our clickers, right? Um, we have a martingale here, which is another form of training collar. We have long leads. Now, again, this isn't everything, but I just wanted to give you guys an idea of how big a balanced trainer's toolbox is and should be, right? And I think every, every time that we learn a new technique or master something new, our goal should be learn how to use more tools. So that being said, a lot of balanced dog training in essence is we are technicians, we also have to learn how to use tools. And I think one thing that happens very commonly is tools get judged without knowing the practice of those tools, right? So for example, uh, the prong collar, the one with the points on it, anything that has points on it that looks like it could potentially be cruel, to be very honest, it was designed to not be cruel for an animal. And this is something you only learn with practice and application, right? So there are so many times that as, as a trainer, people are going to want to try and put you in a category and they want to put you in, are you positive only? Because that's what I believe in with the limited amount of knowledge that I know. And then there are people who want to put you in another category because that's their philosophies that they believe in. The reality of it is, is um, every tool that you use has a proper way of being used. And my mentor used to say, 
um, you know, a tool is just a tool. Without a technician behind that tool, that tool is useless. Based on the technique of that technician, based on how the skill level of that technician, you will see the effectiveness of that tool, right? So think of it like giving someone who's never used a hammer before a hammer and then see them make a bunch of mistakes. Have someone teach that person how to use the hammer and you're going to see that they start off real slow and they get better and better and better at it over and over. And that's usually what our job is with a lot of these tools uh, with, uh, with clients, right? And all of these tools across the board are either used for management, are either used to, for safety, are either used for focus and attention grabbing. And these, these tools, in essence, are designed for um, helping shape new behaviors. Now, the end goal of everything is that we don't have to rely on these tools, Right? This is the end goal and what should be the end goal of balanced dog training. Once we've shaped the behavior, conditioned the behavior, and turned the command into a behavior that happens regularly, we no longer need tools in order to get the result from our dogs. Okay, So this is, um, this is something I just wanted to explain to you guys today and teach you guys about balanced dog training. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and put them uh, into the live chat real quick. Um, and I'm happy to answer them uh, because uh, it is, it's very important that we educate as many people as possible on that this exists. <laughs> any questions, y'all? Let's see. What's up, Navid? All right, how long should we use our collar on our dog? Here is a here is a strategy of especially I think someone in your scenario, right? You I know you and your family practice a lot with your dog. Usually what we want to do is we want to keep using tools on our dogs until we see that their level of responsibility uh, is is they're holding themselves accountable for things, right? So for example, it's like, when do you take the training wheels off of a bike for your kid? When their confidence develops, when you see that their technique gets better, uh, when you see that the, mis the errors and the mistakes get lesser and lesser and lesser, right? Um, same thing with dogs, right? So uh, especially with, with your dog, he's relatively young still. So I wouldn't, I would continue to use training tools on our dogs until they start maturing, right? Because there have been so many times I get calls where people say, oh, my dog was great. And then the dog turns eight months. And then all of a sudden the dog changes uh, their behavior. They start being more assertive. They stop checking in with the owners. And that's simply because they grew up, right? They went through adolescence. So your goal would be really make sure that you uh, that you trust your dog before trying to switch or phase out any tools, right? So that's what I would recommend, right? Not until he's a little bit more mature and until you completely trust him, okay? Thanks for that question, Navid. I really appreciate it. Anyone else with any questions? Mm hmm mm hmm Starbucks in the morning. Also, I got this new microphone. How's the audio? It reminds me of like like a boy band. Like I'm, I'm in a boy band of dog trainers. All right. Not sure how the audio sounds. I think it's good. But if it's not good, please let me know. All righty, guys. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up early. Oh, thanks. Oh, there you go. What's up, Susan? All right. My friend's dog pulls hard on a prong collar. It doesn't help. 
is that cruel for her to keep using it? Um, very good question. So anytime that there is sustained pressure or resistance to a tool, the first thing that we want to look at is we want to see it could be user error, right? So some of the common things, again, this is why you need to have someone coach you on how to use a tool. Um, usually in situations like that, the collar is too big, right? So sometimes people will put a prong collar on the dog. Um, either the prong collar is too big and link wise. So like they make links like that are this big versus the standard link, which is this big. Um, so that way the surface area area isn't uh, grabbing the dog's attention as well as it should. Um, another thing could be it's just physically too, the circumference is too big. So uh, sometimes people will have a collar and they'll just be able to slip it over their dog's neck, which is completely wrong, which gets rid of the whole, um, the, the whole purpose of the constriction of the collar if it's too large, right? So then it just ends up being, you know, bottoming out and being a fixed length and the dog starts choking themselves. Uh, I would ask them to, to seek something out, even if you wanted to send them my number, I'm happy to give a free video consultation and just troubleshoot that problem with them. Um, because learning how to use your tools is super important. Um, I really wish there was more videos on it. Maybe we'll make more videos on YouTube about how to put on certain tools, how to use them properly, because usually it's user error. However, that being said, I have also trained dogs. Um, you know, before we cancel out user, or I want to check out user error first because, but there's been many times that I've trained dogs who have become desensitized to pulling in general, right? And these types of dogs have, it doesn't matter what you put on them, choke chain, flat collar, harness, anything, their drive to drag them and pull and obsession over the environment is so strong that they actually tune out right? They, they don't care that they're cutting off their airways. They just keep going and going and going. So I've met that dog before. In those circumstances, we usually want to start training in a lower distraction level environment, lower distraction level environment. And we want to experiment with a couple different tools. So it, I'm not sure what the scenario is with your dog or with your friend's dog, but in certain, certain circumstances, if the prong collar is fitted properly, and if the technique is proper and the dog is still not coming out of the obsession or the pulling, then in those, then in those situations, we really want to, uh, we, we may move over to the e-collar. Okay. The e-collar has a slightly different attention grabbing sensation than a prong collar. Actually, not a little different. It's very different. It's actually, in my opinion, it's less combative than, let's say, a jerk on a chain, right? So the traditional way that you would use a, a, e or a training collar, if the dog pulls, you would give a little yank and it would grab the dog's attention and they would give you focus, right? In certain circumstances, though, the dog has gotten so used to the fighting of the neck that they kind of almost prepare themselves for it and then and they struggle the whole time. Uh, the e-collar can be a very useful tool to grab the dog's attention because what the e-collars do, e-collars are, the modern day e-collars are very much like Thames machines. If you guys have ever been to the physical therapist, chiropractor, they put those pads on you that constrict your muscles and like throw like a little vibration uh, sensation, electro vibration through your muscles. Um, modern day e-collars in essence are like that. Right, So when it's on the dog's neck, instead of it constricting and choking and creating this wanting to pull forward type of sensation, um, what it does, it'll, it'll actually grab, contract the dog's neck and bring the dog's focus to what's happening to them in a, in a present form. Right, So it makes the dogs more present or more mindful of what's happening. So uh, it is possible that moving to an e-collar would be very useful. I have another client, actually I just saw her at the park the other day. Um, who she has a Vishla, or not a Vishla, a German short-haired pointer. Really, really sweet dog. Her name's Kiki. And this dog is so obsessed over the environment and the birds and the trees and the smells, which is very common for hunting dogs, that um, even though she's a puppy, uh, we had to actually convert the dog to remote collar training because of how distracted the brain is. Now, some this is where a situation where sometimes genetics gets in the way. The dog does like food, but the dog likes squirrels and smelling the ground way more than food, right? Um, the dog uh, does respond to minor corrections on leash, but what happens is the dog likes the environment way more than that, right? So it's not uncommon for you to actually see working 
hunting dogs, so Vishla, German short herd pointers, Weimariners, um, you know, you name it, there's a whole category of those dogs to see them actually get remote trained or to see hounds, for example. Um, I can't explain to you how many beagles I've been able to help um, using remote collars, right? Now, this is just uh, the, because beagles are constantly tracking and sniffing. And one of the biggest complaints I get from beagles is uh, people think they're stupid. They're not stupid. They're just busy all the time, right? <laughs> so uh, I, would, I, would I would have her call me, consult with me. I'm happy to talk to her. No charges. I just want to help people right now during this time. Um, and let me troubleshoot with her what she's doing wrong. Um, and then that way, I'll be able to give her the best advice and the best recommendation. Okay, great. That was a thank you so much for that question, Susan. I really appreciate it. I can't wait to get started working with you guys again. Um, any other uh, questions? Any other questions that I can answer, guys? That was really helpful. I'm here for you all. So any questions that you have, please bring them my way. Mm-hmm. Let me go ahead and put my number down on the screen, guys. If you guys can go ahead and uh, this is for you, Susan. It's uh, 310. All right, perfect. Um, and then also, if you guys can, I'm not sure if you guys are on Instagram, if you aren't, but go ahead and follow me. I'm going to put my handle right here, Canis Behavior. Also, if you guys are already subscribed to my YouTube channel, um, we have a new episode of the podcast that just came out, uh, which uh, we're talking about pure positive dog training, the great practices of it, uh, the, the, the right ways to do it, the wrong ways to do it, um, and uh, kind of what our recommendations are to, to, to better positive reinforcement training when you're in that format of training. Um, all right, Navid, cool. Let's see. What about toys as motivation instead of food? So great question. So when we're using reinforcement, so whatever the dog finds valuable, it could be food, it could be toys, it could be praise. I had a dog once I trained that liked getting belly rubs on the couch. No joke. Pretty shut down, insecure dog. But the one thing that I saw made that dog light up was allowing her on the couch and rubbing her belly over and over and over. So it was so funny. It was kind of a long process, but I would teach her to sit. When she would sit, I would say, okay, to the couch, and I'd rub her belly. Then I'd make her get off. Then I'd make her teach her to lay down. And when she would lay down, I'd say, on the couch, rub her belly, right? So toys are a good way of using uh, – are one way of using um, reinforcers, right? Um, however, what we want to start doing is little by little, we're going to start phasing out how often we have to reward the dog with something. Right, but I seen so I, I've trained so many people to teach their dogs to do stuff uh, with the use of a tug toy or the use of a squeaky tennis ball, um, and you can actually get dogs to do crazy things like jump through hoops of fire or, um, you know, one one really awesome person I, I think one of my clients who's who's taken this um, who's taken this so far is is uh, my friend Rob. So this is his handle on Instagram. If you guys want to check out his dog, his name is Goose. Um, go ahead and add him, follow him. The tricks and the hard work that he puts in with that dog, you know, I taught him his foundation, but then he went extra to just learn other stuff, right? Um, it is, it, it, he uses a tennis ball and toys to reinforce this dog and not food. And you see how motivated this dog is. Um, so yes, you can use toys to motivate your dog instead of food. Um, sometimes I think that's better to get more like a, a higher level reaction with that toy. Um, and then eventually what we want to do is we can even phase all that stuff out. And I want you to start rewarding your dog for things that would naturally be given to them, right? So uh, freedom is a reward. Affection is a reward. Going on the walk is a reward. So always what you want to do is just ask the dog to do something as a prerequisite to getting something he's already going to get. 
right? So that's why structured play is really important. Tell them to sit, tell them to lay down, then let them tug the toy, tell them to sit, tell them to stay, then throw the ball, then release him to go get the ball. That type of stuff is going to burn out more brain calories. And then little by little, your dog's not going to rely on food being on your body. Your dog's going to start relying on like, oh, if I want something, I know I have to work for it. And that's okay, right? We want our dogs to feel they have to earn a lot of the stuff that they get in life because that's how we develop work ethic and that's how we develop loyalty in our dogs. Cool. Uh, any other uh, questions you guys have? This is fun. I was not expecting so many questions, but I love it. Keep them coming, please. Mm -mm -mm. Also, I wanted to ask you, so the, the term is balanced dog training, right? But a couple things that I've learned uh, that, I, that I talk to people, I listen, I hear their opinions. Um, if I were to ask you guys what the word balanced means, how does it make you feel? Because I, I, I do a lot of interviewing of my clients, and I think this is a good thing because um, – you know, if I were to say the word like dominance, right, I've interviewed many of my clients, or if I were to say the word alpha, right, it makes us feel a certain way, right? And usually when I ask uh, my female clients, alpha usually means like mean or rude, um, um, kind of a jerk, right? Like it has this connotation, the word alpha. And it's so funny how, you know, across genders and across life experiences, we start saying that there's a different mean, like a word can have a different emotional charge. What emotional charge does the word balance mean to you, right? Does it seem hokey? Does it seem too spiritual? Does it seem too neutral? Does it seem, what does it seem like to you guys? That'd be a really interesting question to know the answer to. All right. So again, the question is, what emotional connotation does the word balanced bring to you guys? Is it a good term? Um, does it tell you what, what it is that we do? <laughs> balance. There you go, Eric. <laughs> what I'm trying to get with my dog. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Um, here's, here's an interesting thing I've learned also in dog training always when when i couldn't train or get through uh it's hard your balance seems hard to achieve yeah it totally does it totally does uh, I, I understand that um what i've learned in dog training is the dogs that i couldn't train you know luckily i worked in a team so if i couldn't train a dog there was another trainer who had more experience than me that would help me figure out the right strategy so i'm so blessed to have so many mentors and people that i worked with but if I couldn't get through to a dog or I couldn't understand the dog, usually what I had to do is I had to have some introspection and be like, what is it about me that is not getting through to this dog, right? Am I being too impatient? Am I not being consistent? Am I not being organized? Am I not anticipating behavior? Am I not, uh, am I not treating the dog fairly, right? Like what is it about me that is making me ineffective with this dog? And so, um, so I think the idea of, of uh, trying to achieve balance, it is a very dynamic thing. You guys got to remember we're having a relationship with our dog, right? Um, and very much like a human relationship, a human to human relationship, it takes work. It takes compromise. It takes understanding. It takes, you know, trying to also meet the dog's needs, not just our own needs, Right. And so there's always a couple things that we have to figure out on the emotional level, on the mental level for the dog, even on the physical level. Like sometimes the dog might need a lot more exercise than we can provide them. So we have to figure out a workaround. Right. Um, so it's it's seeking balance to your point, Susan, is a little bit um, is difficult, um, seems hard to achieve. 
but the same way that we can that we have to strive to achieve balance in our relationships and our human relationships the same thing happens with the dog the cool thing in my opinion is dogs are a lot more simple than humans right dogs don't lie dogs wear their feelings on their sleeve um you know dogs are a lot more honest and they'll be very more direct to you than let's say your best friend you know so it's really important that we open our eyes open our minds up to a couple things that we could be doing better um, and sometimes it's not obvious. It's really, really not obvious. So, um, don't worry, Erica, we're going to get there tomorrow. All right. So you think it's a great term control and play? Yeah. 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 Um, here's another way to look at balanced dog training is we see that different dogs come with different statistics, right? Or like stats. Um, I don't mean like reputation. I mean, they come out of the womb and they have different characteristics, right? So we might have four or five dogs in a litter, and two of those puppies might be super energetic. Two of those puppies might be super introverted and shy and sensitive. Uh, one of those puppies might be uh, super friendly and super going with the flow, you know? So we might have a different variety of genetics, right? Then what we can do is we can take each of those dogs doesn't matter if they have similar personalities or not. We can put them in a different environment with a different type of family, a family with no kids, a family where the dog's the only, uh, a, 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 sorry, a family where the dog is the only child and a family with kids. And we can see a whole different group of different behavioral problems happen in those scenarios, right? Um, we could also see, you know, the personalities of each of those owners be very, very different. So balance is hard to find because we're trying to balance not just two variables it's not just you and the dog it's you the dog the environment he's growing up in his genetic predisposition you're trying to create balances imagine like trying to balance a bunch of plates right like on a stick like they do in the circus right that's almost what finding the right protocols and training for you and your dog are sometimes right? Uh, because there's so many dynamics. The dogs will go through different developmental stages. But here's the thing to that. Having a strong enough foundation underneath your dog where, yes, you may have to adjust certain things of your dog training. It all starts with you knowing what you want and you gradually chiseling away at issues and being determined to uh, raise the dog to your standard. Right. So if you want something from your dog, let's figure out maybe we're going about it the wrong way. Maybe let's um, let's try a different angle. But the goal is, is we're going to be so determined to get what we want that we might come at it three or four different angles. And eventually, boom, we find the right way to get it. Right. Uh, and something specific for that dog. Right. So this is where the balanced dog training becomes a it, it is really we are very determined to solve problems and get and get to the end result if it, if it's possible and if it's humane to the dog right cool um any other questions guys so let's see the balance why don't cool all right y'all if there are no more questions i'm going to go ahead and sign off uh, real quick for those of you guys who are still on uh, today we are launching our very first, and we actually are starting it actually in the next 30 minutes. Uh, we are starting our very first online puppy group class. So I'm super excited. Those of you guys who helped promote that, um, had your friends sign up. Thank you guys so much. We're super excited. Uh, literally after this, I'm logging on to Zoom and we're going to be working with four puppies online. And then after that, we have six rescue dogs um, who are going to, who are helping um, to rehabilitate these rescue dogs online. And we're going to be working on dog management, teaching these dogs how to play, teaching these dogs obedience. So I'm so excited. Thank you guys so much. Um, I love my community. I love my clients. Thank you guys so much for being loyal. I know it's a lot of the same, same, it's the same, uh, there, there's a handful of people that I know are coming back every single week. And I really, really can't thank you guys enough. You know, if there was one of you on here or seven or 20, um, you know, I, I'm just grateful. Thank you guys so much for just being here with me, learning about dogs, listening to what we have to say here at Canis. Um, and I love you guys. Thank you so much. Um, we'll see you guys next week. If you guys have any ideas for topics, email me. Email me. If there's something that you think you want to learn about um, that you want 
to to be lectured on or we can create a workshop on it, send it to me because I would love to uh, give you guys the content that you guys need. Okay, so if there's anything that you guys want to leave in the comments, either before or after the live stream is done, or email me. Let me go ahead and send you my email. Go ahead and email me there and send me some topics that you guys would like to listen to. All right. Um, again, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, go, make sure you guys add us on Instagram. It's at Canis Behavior. Um, make sure you check in that you're subscribed to our YouTube channel if you guys haven't subscribed already. Um, and uh, make sure you follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Facebook if that's your thing. Instagram if that's your thing. Um, also, just want to remind you guys that we do have our Canis Academy online now. Uh, we are going to be opening up probably within the next month, basic obedience group class uh, soon. However, if this stay-at-home order drops, we may be able to actually start real group classes in the park. This is great. Um, but anyways, thank you guys so much. Spread the word. Spread the love. Thank you guys again. I'll see you guys later. Bye.